Okay, uh, we're back in Matthew 14 again. Matthew 14, if you want to be turning there. Uh, we think of, in, in connection to this passage, uh, we're asked the question, who has, who has control? Who has control in our government, in our world? Who are we trusting? Uh, our boss? Our, you know, there's some trust that we need to have, right, in our uh, leaders or bosses or coaches or what have you. But in the things that really matter, the deeper things, the deep things of the soul, of the spirit, where do we turn to? How do we know? And so forth. And God has over and over and over uh, has revealed in his word uh, who he is and we need to constantly be going there, right? In Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah were this uh, exposure of God's people, the sins of God's people, their failures, their refusal to turn to him, the judgments and the discipline that God was going to bring on his people. And then in chapter 40, starting in verse 1 and following, is the encouraging part where God says, look, man, I'm here to save you. And in order for us to enjoy that part of God, uh, enjoying the, really his deliverance and so forth, we need to see honestly uh, where we have been without trusting him and doing our own thing. So that we can see, man, I deserve judgment but then God comes and shows us how wonderful he is. But to again, to know who, how wonderful he is, we need to know him, his character, and who is he? And so in Isaiah 40, starting in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Therefore the idol, and idol can be any part of creation, can be things... Work, people, spouse, children, self, anything, any create, part of creation can be an idol. As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, and goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. <laughs> Isaiah is mocking. But as I said, idols don't have to be that physical thing that, you know, that we uh, bow down to and we have to take care of for us to be important, to, for us to have life. An idol can be another human being or self. Um, so, you know, God says, don't you know, have you not heard? Verse 21, has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. All the Putins, all the Trumps, all the Bidens, all the leaders of the world, all the smartest people, Elon Musk and all of us, meaningless compared to God, no matter how much power. And so in life, when it comes down to everyday life, if we don't remember that, then we get all out of whack, right? We get all anxious and begin to <laughs> manipulate and get angry and frustrated and 
by the time we know we're not acting in a very godly way, we're not loving, we're trying to get our way. And Jesus' disciples were no different. Jesus' disciples were like you and me. So Jesus had to test them over and over and over and over so that they would learn that Jesus is God and in control of all things. Now, that sounds very pretty and sounds religious and it sounds spiritual and so forth, but it needs to be applied in everyday life, in every situation, so that we live a, a life that's honoring to him, an effective life. And by effective, I mean a life that reflects Jesus. And when a life reflects Jesus, either people are going to hate us, they're going to be threatened by us, or they're going to say, oh my goodness, thank you for leading me to Jesus. Thank you for leading me to the truth. Thank you for leading me to freedom. Freedom from the effects of sin and freedom from the fear of people. Freedom from having demand that things work out the way we want it to be. No, no. A steady life of trust and faith in Jesus who is God. And so in the book of Matthew, Jesus, remember, we have said that Jesus has been presented as the king of kings. And he's being rejected. The nation has rejected him. And he's demonstrated over and over. And they've rejected him. So I said, okay. Then uh, it's going to take time for me then to go ahead and die on the cross. And I'm going to leave. And there's going to be a time where you're going to have to leave, uh, live without me here on earth. I'll be present spiritually. And so how are you to live? Well, first and foremost, you need to know who I am. Right? And in contrast to that, uh, we have Herod in John 14. And Herod is uh, a regular human fallen leader that, who is in contrast to Jesus. Right? And we've seen this, chapter 14, uh, all the way to verse 21. And the contrast continues. But now the disciples need to learn. Uh, so there's a testing of the disciples here. And they shows up that they need faith in him. They need faith in him because everybody recognizes Jesus' power. But recognizing Jesus' power doesn't mean that we know him as God. We don't necessarily uh, recognize him that he has control over cancer, over divorce, over misapplication, over things not working out, over not being loved, not being respected. But we, he has control and we need to turn to him, to him for life and actually worship him. Actually worship him. So we're going to cover verse 22. To verse 36, let me read the passage. Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. Immediately, that is after he had fed the 5,000, more like 10,000 plus, and uh, 12 baskets were left over for each and every disciple for them to learn he is creator. Um, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And, and when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. 
But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took him hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. When they had uh, crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. As many as touched it were cured. What's going on here? As I said, this is a contrast between a fallen human leader, Herod, and Jesus. And last time we went to some of those contrasts, and we're going to continue to find these contrasts here. So we have the setting, I'm going to, verse 22 and 23, the setting of this passage. And then there's a testing of uh, verse 24, 27, the, the testing of the 12. And the point is you need to have faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, verse 28 to 33, and then all recognize Jesus' power. So uh, Jesus had just demonstrated in the previous paragraph that he's creator, right? You only have five loaves and two fish to feed 10,000 people, okay? Well, he demonstrated that he's creator. I mean, at his word, the whole world was created. Never mind the whole world, the whole universe was created. Do we believe that? How does it show up? <laughs> when life isn't working out, how do we react? Do we know, well, God is creator, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Aren't we all the same? And we're all the same. Uh, so Jesus just demonstrated that he was creator. And Jesus knows the multitude's erroneous reaction to the miracles. The re uh, erroneous reaction to the miracles. Um, in John 6, John chapter 6, the same miracle, uh, there's two responses that Jesus says, mm, you're, <laughs> you're not getting it. In fact, you're applying here the wrong thing. Uh, John 6, in verse 15, this after he had finished, you know, the miracle of feeding the 5,000 men plus another, you know, women and children. So, uh, verse 15, so Jesus perceived that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king. Withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. They wanted to make him king because they were being satisfied with all the physical things. And they were not seeing their own sinfulness, number one. And they were not seeing who Jesus actually was, who is God. Oh, let's make him king. He's, man, he's giving us all the food, all the food stamps we want. <laughs> no. Uh, and then Jesus confronts them in verse 26 of John 6, verse 26. Jesus then uh, answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs that led you to understand that I am God, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Your bellies are full. That's why you're following me. Want to make me king? You don't know me very well. So this is what's happening here. But Jesus' disciples could have also be missing the point of the miracle. That is, yes, I am Messiah, but I am God himself. And I don't think you get it yet. I am creator and I can feed and I am Messiah, but I am actually God. Um... And because they were related to Jesus, they might, they might have been thinking, well, <laughs> we got it made, man. I mean, our boss is Messiah. We ain't going to be going through any difficulties because we're set. Oh, they need to learn. Wait a minute. It doesn't work like that as long as we live in this world, fallen world. You need to have faith in Jesus that he has control 
But that doesn't mean that we're not going to experience any difficulties. So he orders, right after he fed the 10,000 people or more, he compels, the Greek word there is he orders them, he compels them, go that way. In other words, go away from me. Um, he made the disciples go into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and he sent the multitudes away with their bellies full. Now, the disciples in verse 22, they were given specific instructions, were they not? Go to the specific direction, to the other side. He compels them. He urges them. He's got something in mind for them. And then in verse 23, Jesus demonstrates, look, I don't need the popularity. I don't, be, I don't need to be recognized. I'm not a Herod. I'm not after popularity. It's not like, you know, politicians. You know, vote for me. Vote for me. No. She says, hey, disciples, you know, go to the other side. Hey, crowd, you filled? Okay, go. <laughs> what a contrast, no? What a contrast to mere human beings who are fallen in need for people to raise them up. No. My wife doesn't respect me. My husband doesn't love me. Boo, boo, boo. <laughs> and politicians. <laughs> Not Jesus. No, disciples, go on. Go to the other side. Hey, crowd. I, I need to go be with my father. Because that's really where life comes from. Relationship with my father. Right? I don't need the crowds. I don't need... I need to be with my father. Wow. Wouldn't that be great if we would all do that? See, man, what I need is, okay, even if life doesn't work, I, I need to spend time with my father. So he goes. Um, his priority is to be with the father because that's what's going to strengthen him. And he says, my goal here is to really train the disciples. So, Lord, uh, father, let's, let's, let's work together here, probably. And so that's where he's praying. Now, Verse 24, here comes the testing. Now, <laughs> isn't there something? Jesus had just directed them to, some, to do something, and they were obeying, right? They were obeying. And then, boom, verse 24. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Don't you just hate when that happens? You decide to obey God, and all of a sudden, all kinds of problems come. <laughs> they were obeying. And by the way, you know, they were trying hard to obey. How do I know that? Well, it says the wind was contrary to them, right? They could have just, okay, let's follow the wind and be on the land and be safe, and that's it. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus told us to go to the other side. And even though it's hard, it's like, oh, ah, we need to obey Jesus. I mean, it's right there, not making it up, right? The wind was contrary to them, and they would want to obey Jesus. And they were faced with a mortal danger. Mortal danger. Yeah. Um, and by the way, this, is, this has happened already, right? In, uh, in the previous paragraph, when John the Baptist was beheaded, and the disciples, you know, went to Jesus, took the body and went to Jesus, right? Uh, verse 12 of Matthew 14. The disciples came and took the, uh, away the body and buried it, and they went and reported to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He leaves them. <laughs> That's what verse 13 says, no? And when Jesus heard of this about John, he withdrew from there in a the boat to a secluded place by himself. And sometimes we have that experience, God. We cry out to God, cry out to God, nowhere to be found. Because he said, work. Helping us learn and teach us some things. 
So here, okay, disciples, go to the other side. And boom, a wind comes and they're about to drown. They're about to die. Um, it can be great frustration and trouble even when we try to obey God. Uh, right? And then James 1 comes along and says, Count it all joy, brother, when you encounter various trials. What? You masochist. You just want trouble and pain. <laughs> no, no. What James is saying is like, this process that he's taking you through is going to end up in your character being strengthened. You can become more Christ-like because you get to know him more. So Jesus is training his disciples. Listen, yes, I can perform miracles. Yes, I can feed many, many, many people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But I'm much more than just being able to feed people like that. Um, so, uh, it was the fourth watch of the night, verse 26. Fourth watch of the night, like, like between 3 and 6 a.m. They had been all night at this. All night. And it gets scary. I remember fishing in... Uh, Port Mansfield was just a little bit north of uh, South Padre Island. And I had to go with a friend, and we, he had this tiny little boat. And we started to go out. We were maybe, maybe a quarter of a mile, maybe away from the shore. And the wind started picking up. And the boat just started doing this number. It was a tiny little boat. And uh, at first, I just started laughing, you know, oh, man. And then, wait a minute, it's real quickly, it's like, uh, we might die here. The boat, when it comes down, it's like you're hitting concrete. I didn't know that. It's like, like oh my, I'm going to, obviously we made it to shore. But you can imagine. And we were like, um, uh, maybe, maybe a quarter of a mile away from the shore. These guys were miles from shore all night. You can, so you can imagine the fear for hours that they were going to die. So this is what was happening. So, uh, verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. <laughs> you know, when life is terrible, really terrible, and all of a sudden God encounters you in supernatural ways, you think, it's mysterious, it's supernatural, you don't know what to say. So they were scared spitless. I mean, <laughs> they saw him walk in the water. When the disciples saw him, verse 26, walk in the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost, and they were crying. Ah! Literally, they were crying like little babies. We're going to die. It's a ghost. My whole life is going in front of me. <laughs> you got to put yourself in that position where you're hopeless and helpless and you're about to die in a terrible, terrible death. And all of a sudden you see something supernatural and you don't know what in the world to do. And so they were all crying, crying out of fear, it says, Right? Cried out of fear. Verse 20, uh, verse 26. But Jesus comes. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. When Jesus says, take courage, it is I. The Greek is. Ego am I, meaning I am. Any of you remember that phrase? I am. Out of Exodus. When God is telling Moses, go deliver my people. And Moses says, what's your name? They're going to ask me your name. What's your name? God says, tell them. 
I am sent you. I am? That's your name? I am that I am. Jesus just says, don't be afraid. I am. <laughs> now, have you ever been doing something uh, and there's some people and something happens to you really, really stupid and you just want to disappear? Uh, you're riding a bike and all of a sudden you fall off the bike and you get up like nothing. You know, no, no, I'm fine. I remember doing a lawn in my house way over here for Six Mile Line. And I had bought a lawnmower for my brother. You ride on this thing, but it just, the front just turned in the back. You rode on the back. And you, you zero, I mean, you turn real quick like this. And we had a little palm tree. And uh, it had uh, thorns, you know, the leaves of the palm tree. And I was doing my thing and I got so close. And I got off, it threw me off. And what did I do? <laughs> did the numbers do? I got back on the lawnmower. Really? I was bleeding. I didn't care. Why? I look stupid. And I think this was happened to Peter. He had been crying. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> and Jesus shows up. I am. Don't be afraid. <laughs> hey, Jesus, is that you? Help me walk in the water. <laughs> I think that's what was happening. I think that's what happened. When Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Echo in me, don't be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to go to the water. <laughs> I'm not a scaredy chicken like everybody else. Look, look, I'll walk in the water with you. I think that's what was happening. How do I know that? Well, you know, when you look at the scriptures, compared to the narratives, and you come up with something, make sure you've got some clues in the text. Because you can come up with just about anything, right? First of all, Peter's very request reveals the truth. Right? Notice how he words the question. Lord, if it is you, if, if, did I not just tell you I am? What do you mean, if? And then, what follows? He starts walking on water, but he sees the wind and the waves. Like, <laughs> he's going down again. Save me, Lord! I thought you were Mr. Macho Man, better than the other disciples. Ew. Ew. And there's another clue I'll show you in a minute. But I think that's what's going on. Peter needed some humility. The disciples, they all needed to know, listen, I am Messiah. But I am much more than what you're thinking, man. I am who I am. I am the Lord of the Old Testament. I am God. And Peter, Peter evidently completely missed the point. Because he was so worried about his own ego and embarrassment that he missed the whole point. Right? Have you been walking on water? Oh, you still need to learn, Peter. Okay, come. And notice very, very, very carefully. Verse 29. And he said, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat. You see that? Got out of the boat. And you're going to see why that's important. And walked on the water and came, was, uh, and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, <laughs> totally missing, totally missing, that Jesus himself had been walking on water, and he told him, I am. And it's amazing when we get entangled with our own ego and our own shame and pride, we, we, we get blinded by who, uh, uh, 
we, we're blinded that Jesus is God. And we begin to try to manipulate and get angry and frustrated and do and try to save our own little prideful, little arrogant ego. He totally missed it. Right? And seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out again. He was already crying. Everybody was crying in the boat. Can you imagine now? All the other disciples weren't crying. But Peter was. Oh. Hmm. Save me, Lord. It's it's an um, unfortunate thing that we, the Lord has to take us to those points where we cry, Uncle, right? We think we're hot stuff. God says, okay, let's try on for size a few tests. <laughs> uh, and we're like Peter. Come on, we're like Peter. We think we're hot stuff. We think we deserve honor and glory and respect and love. No, we don't deserve any of that. We deserve hell. That's the reality. Because we have sinned against God. Right? I've told people, and I've said it from the pulpit, if my wife kisses me one more time till I die, it's more than I deserve. If I got to preach one more time, from this pulpit is more than I deserve. And that's the reality. That is the truth. It's not just some pious sounding words. It's the truth. Peter needs to learn. And he was humbled again. Jesus immediately stretched out his, his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you thought you were hot stuff. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? If it is you, did I not tell you I am? Hmm. Wow. So much for the first pope. Here it is. When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. <laughs> I mean, Jesus already done this in Matthew uh, 8. Remember, he had rebuked the wind. And immediately it calmed down. And at that point, the disciples says, man, what kind of man is this anyway? That even the wind and the waves obey him. That was the first time. This time, Jesus didn't have to say anything. <laughs> Did you note know that? He didn't have to say anything. As soon as he got in, it got calm. When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. <laughs> and what would they respond this time? It wasn't like, what kind of a man is this? Verse 33, and those who were in the boat worshipped him. They worshipped him, saying, you are certainly the son of God. And when they said son of God, what they were saying was, you have the very same nature as God the Father. You are God. You got the point. You got the point. Now, I want you to note verse 33. And those who were in the boat, why say that? Why say that? Because in verse 29, Peter had gotten out of the boat. No? Another indication. 
that Peter was probably still licking his wounds. Those who had stayed in the boat, those who were in the boat, worshiped Jesus. I suspect Peter was still had his tail between his legs with his head down, looking foolish. Mm. The sooner we humble ourselves, the sooner we embrace our limitations, the sooner we embrace the fact that we don't deserve anything, but we can only claim the mercy and grace of God, the better off we're going to be. We can actually worship Jesus. Now, it's a summary now. In contrast to Herod and Jesus, now we have verse 34 to verse 36. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched were cured in contrast to Herod in the previous paragraph, right? At the beginning of chapter 14. Herod was a leader. But he was yet there to consume, to use, and if need be, kill. John the Baptist to get what he wanted and to save his ego. In compared to Herod, this, to Herod this fallen um, arrogant, selfish leader is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is not here to use. He doesn't need us. Jesus is not here to pick up his ego and, no. Nah. He's here to heal, to strengthen, to develop, to give life. When people turn to him in faith, right? Because he is God. And that's the point. In contrast to this world... In other words, you want to reject me as king? Okay. Well, here's what you have in the world. These leaders who are about themselves. Selfish and just using people. In contrast to Jesus. But amazingly, amazingly, mind-boggling, they still rejected Jesus. And that's what we're going to find out in chapter 15 and following. Right? Right? They had already rejected him, but here's the contrast. Amazing, amazing. So, my first application then. We must humble ourselves and realize that we have nothing to offer God but gratitude and worship. Uh, It's hard to get there at times. It's hard to get there. Because, well, we have so many resources that we can use, right? We have a great brain. We have a great physique. We have beauty. We have whatever, right? Education, money. (sighs) When we realize, man, who Jesus is and who we are, like, my, my goodness, Lord, why are you so good to me? I don't understand. In fact, You're so good being God, being God. Um, You do what you do for me. Thank you. Thank you for the gratitude and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why, you know, like Sunday mornings, to, to be thinking about why do I go to church? Who is Jesus? I need to sing to Jesus. I need to give myself to Jesus. He is worthy. And when we're not ready to do that, to say, Lord, help me. 
Help me because I'm angry. I'm focusing on my ego. I'm focusing on life is not working for me. And I'm not full of gratitude for you. I'm not worried to worship you, Lord. Help me. Help me, Lord. You know, we find this in this passage. When the disciples finally learned Jesus is God, they worshiped him. They worshiped him. But we need to humble ourselves and realize that. Here's another application. Here's another application. If we're going to see the great works of God and not be bored by our puny self-sufficiency, self-importance, and pleasures, then we must live a life of faith and obedience. A life of faith and obedience. And that's very contra in contrast to the American way of life, the world, really. Right? Pleasure, 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 pleasure. Amusement, 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 amusement. Everything is, I got to be amused. Even in the news, they start off with music and all this, you know, boom, and all this to entertain, to amuse. Right? How much money do we pay our athletes? Mm. Because they amuse us. And in the final analysis, it doesn't matter, right? Does it matter to God who won the Super Bowl? Does it matter to really to any of us? No, it was just amusing. It was just fun. Is there anything with being amused and fun? No. But when that becomes the all in all, when that becomes what drives us in life and not... The Lord Jesus Christ, we are in deep trouble. That's why sometimes our lives are meaningless and just full of frustration and loneliness. No power to live for Christ because we got to be amused. Even Jesus needs to feed us and do miracles and we will follow him. Nah, nah. But when we say, you know what, I'm going to live by faith and I'm going to obey him and I'm going to stop trying to just fulfill my life, my pleasures, what I want to do. OK, follow that and you will not see much of the power of God. We're going to have to continue to be more and more amused, more and more places to go and experience more buzz Otherwise, life is like, well, what's there to live for? I guess we're going to do this other thing to have fun again. And it's all boring and meaningless. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Live by faith and obey the Lord. We're not self-sufficient. We don't have self-importance. It's what God does. Obey him by faith. That's the second application. The third application. People need the Lord. No. People need the Lord. These people that, you know, <laughs> Jesus, if we just touch the fringe of your cloak, man. People need the Lord. Your neighbor, your relatives. Your co-workers, your fellow students, your cousins, your aunts, uncles. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. They need the gospel. They need to know that Jesus came to die for their sins. And that believing in him, they are saved from the righteous judgment of God. There is a day of reckoning. There's no way around it. We are all, all, all accountable to God. And so, you know, but we're not going to share the gospel unless we are turned on to the gospel. Or we, unless we fall in love with Jesus and see him for who he is. He is the great I am of the Old Testament. He is the creator. He is the one that controls all wind and water, all nature. 
Do we believe that? And does it show the way we live? Does it show? Or are we just wanting to do our own thing and be satisfied and nobody's going to tell me what to do? Thank you very much. Especially you, preacher. <laughs> uh, I'm just another sinner, that's all. But the Word of God is there. The Word of God is there. So Jesus was training his disciples. And they were tested. And they needed to learn that Jesus is God and in control of all things. So let my life be the